Hi YouTube, in this video I'm going to try to explain morphosyntactic alignment. Morphosyntactic alignment is something that seems very difficult when you first hear about it, but once you understand it, it's actually quite simple. Before I get started, I'm just going to go through some basic terminology just to make sure that everyone's on the same page. So the most important thing in regards to understanding morphosyntactic alignment is the distinction between an intransitive verb and a transitive verb. An intransitive verb has only one role or argument. For example, the children are playing. The only role in that sentence is the children. A transitive verb has two roles or arguments. So a sentence like the children chase the dog. It involves both the children and the dog. The second bit of terminology, which is not as important, but will come up several times in this video, is grammatical person. Grammatical person is basically the relationship between who is speaking and who is being spoken about. First person is the person who is speaking. That's words like I, we, myself, etc. The second person is the person who is being spoken to. That's words like you or yourself. And the third person is anyone or anything else. He, she, the woman. David Bowie. Despite the name grammatical person, it doesn't actually have to be a person. It could be an animal or even an inanimate object. For example, a dog or some houses. Bearing in mind the difference between a transitive and an intransitive verb, there are three possible roles that a noun can play in a basic sentence. It can be the sole argument or the subject of an intransitive sentence. It can be the agent of a transitive sentence, that is, the person or thing performing the verb, or it can be the patient of a transitive sentence, that is, the person or thing experiencing the verb. Morphosyntactic alignment refers to the way that we treat each of these roles. The most common sort of alignment is nominative accusative alignment, where we treat the subject and the agent the same, and we call this the nominative case, and we treat the patient distinctly and call that the accusative case. An example of a language that uses nominative accusative alignment is Czech. Here are some examples using the Czech word for girl, holka. Holka běží, the girl runs. Holka jí jablko, the girl eats an apple. And já vidím holku, I see the girl. When the girl is the subject or the agent, the word holka appears in its base nominative form. But when it is the patient, it changes to the accusative form holku. This sort of alignment is what we use in English. It's most obvious using sentences with pronouns. For example, she runs, she eats an apple, I see her. Common English nouns don't change. The girl remains the same, regardless of the role in the sentence. However, we can still say that English follows nominative accusative alignment because of word order. The subject and the agent both appear before the verb, while the patient appears after the verb. Another possibility is to treat the subject and the patient alike as the absolutive case and the agent separately as the ergative case. This is called ergative absolutive alignment or simply ergativity. An example of an ergative language is the Basque language which is spoken in southern France and northern Spain. In Basque the absolutive form of a noun is the basic form and the ergative is formed by adding a suffix to this. So for example, ni etori nice. I have arrived. Nik liburua idakuri tut. I have read the book. Kisonak ni ikusi nao. The man has seen me. Ergative accusative alignment is somewhat similar to the passive voice in a nominative accusative language like English. For example, the previous two sentences could be translated as the book was read by me and I was seen by the man. But in an ergative language, this would be the most natural way to express these ideas, unlike English where it is an unusual construction. All ergative languages treat the agent like the subject in at least some situations, although which situation depends on the specific language. This is called split ergativity. One of the most common ways to split ergativity is based on tense. It's common for a language to use ergative alignment in the past tense, but nominative accusative alignment in the present tense. It's also common for ergativity to be split based on person. We have the idea of an animacy hierarchy, which ranges from highly animate, first person, down to low animate, third person, non-living. 
Things that are higher on the animacy hierarchy are more likely to use a nominative accusative alignment. Things that are lower on the animacy hierarchy are more likely to use ergative alignment. An example of a language with split ergativity based on person is the gerbil language spoken in northern Queensland in Australia. It has nominative accusative alignment in the first person and second person, and ergative absolutive alignment in the third person. Another possibility is to say that the subject is sometimes like an agent and sometimes like a patient. We call this active stative alignment or split intransitive alignment. In a split intransitive language, some intransitive verbs will take an argument with an agent marker and some will take an argument with a patient marker. Depending on whether the subject acts in an agent-like manner or a patient-like manner, for example, in the Waris language, which is spoken in Papua New Guinea, to say something like, I go, you'd use an agent form as the subject, but to say something like, he dies, you'd use a patient form, because going is something that you do, while dying is something that you experience. Yet another possibility is to say that the subject is completely distinct from both the agent and the patient, and to have three distinct forms. This is called tripartite alignment. This sort of alignment is actually quite rare, because it adds unnecessary complexity for little real benefit. The subject is always clear in an intransitive sentence, so there's no need for it to have its own special marking. An example of tripartite alignment can be found in the Nez Perce language, which is spoken in the northwestern United States. The subject is the base form, and the agent and patient add distinct suffixes to clarify their role in the sentence. Some languages make no distinction at all between the subject, agent, and patient, not even by word order. This is called neutral alignment. It's quite rare for obvious reasons. It leads to ambiguous transitive sentences. An example of neutral alignment can be found in the Ainu language, which is spoken in northern Japan. Ainu has neutral alignment in the second person and third person. For example, the sentence Ainu enukar can mean the man sees you or you see the man. Ainu does have ways to distinguish the agent from the patient, but this is the most natural way of saying the sentence. The last way that we can group the subject, agent, and patient is to treat the subject distinctly as the intransitive case, and then treat the agent and patient similarly as the transitive case. This sort of alignment is very rare, found in only a handful of languages in Central Asia. It combines the unnecessary complexity of tripartite alignment with the ambiguity of neutral alignment as a sort of worst possible combination. Nevertheless, it is found in a few languages. For example, Rushani, which is spoken in Afghanistan and Tajikistan. In the present tense, Rushani has a normal nominative accusative alignment, but in the past tense it uses a transitive intransitive alignment. The subject uses the same form as the present tense nominative form, while both the agent and patient use the same forms as the present tense accusative. The agent and patient are still distinguished by word order. Because alignment can be indicated in many different ways, such as case marking, word order and verb conjugation, a language may use different types of alignment for different elements of a single sentence. So in the Rishani example, the case marking is transitive intransitive, but the word order is still distinctly nominative accusative, even in the past tense. There are other types of alignment that are more involved than just grouping subject, agent, and patient in different ways. We can also have direct inverse alignment, where the marking is based on the relative position of the agent and the patient in the animacy hierarchy. This sort of alignment is fairly common in Native American languages. This example comes from Navajo. The noun with the higher animacy always has to come before the noun with the lower animacy, and which is the agent and which is the patient are indicated by whether the verb has a direct marker or an inverse marker. The direct marking indicates that the more animate noun is the agent and the less animate noun is the patient, while the inverse marking indicates the opposite. 
Uh, finally, there is Austronesian alignment, which is often difficult for people to grasp, even when they otherwise understand alignment quite well. In Austronesian alignment, the verb is marked with a prefix or suffix, which indicates the alignment that the sentence is using, and different alignments are used to emphasize certain elements of the sentence. As the name suggests, Austronesian alignment is found among the Austronesian languages. This is an example from the Amis language, spoken in Taiwan, using the verb aljup meaning hunt, we can add the agent focus prefix mi to the verb to create a sentence like mi alup ku kapa tu vavui, the man hunts the pig, with the emphasis on the man. Alternatively, we can add the patient focus ma prefix to create a sentence like ma alup nu kapa ku vavui, which means the same thing but places the emphasis on the pig. So something like, a pig is what the man hunts. Notice that in each of these sentences, the element that is being emphasized gets the same particle, ku, before it, regardless of whether it is the agent or the patient. The exact details vary somewhat among the different Austronesian languages, but most of them also have additional focus prefixes and suffixes to emphasize other elements of the sentence, such as the instrument, the man hunted the pig with a spear, or location, the man hunted a pig in the forest. This is all beyond the scope of this video, and Austronesian alignment could probably be a whole video on its own. In fact, I could say a lot more about each of these different alignments, but the video is already long enough as it is. So thanks for watching. Hopefully you found this video interesting, and if not, hopefully you at least found it informative.